Welcome to the front lines. We welcome our viewers from across the United States and Canada, from Europe and the Middle East, from Australia and South America, and of course, from Armenia and Artsakh. It has been a politically tumultuous week in, our, in the Armenian world, and, in it, and the international tensions impacting the major players in the region will clearly have some impact on the already tense situation in the South Caucasus. Inside Armenia, there was a sudden resignation of President Armin Sarkisyan, which raised much speculation and numerous questions regarding who would fill the vacancy. In all the twists and turns of the political arbitrage in Yerevan, a sobering statement was just issued by the Armenian Investigatory Committee, committee reporting on the outcome of its investigations into the November 2021 Azerbaijani incursions into the Sunni region, where 13 Armenian servicemen were captured by Azerbaijani forces. The committee reported its findings that two of the servicemen had been executed by Azerbaijan, while three remain in Azerbaijani custody. This should serve as a reminder that for all the political jockeying we have seen over the last two weeks, indeed over the last several months, there are real lives at stake, real security issues, and a sea of regional and international changes that are and will continue to impact Armenia and Artsakh. Those of you who watch Frontlines know that in our small way, we try to engage in discussions digging into these issues with the hope of bringing access, bringing knowledge, and hopefully some perspectives to our viewers throughout the world. With that in mind, I'd like to make one important, indeed exciting programming note before we get started. Frontlines is pleased to announce that it will be joining Zartok Media, a cutting edge global news media outlet. Those of you who know of Zartok know of its commitment to keeping generations of Armenians throughout the world tuned into Armenia, Artsakh, and the global Armenian diaspora. Garo and I share in this mission, and we are looking forward very much to our new home at Zartok. We'll be premiering on Zartok Media on all of its global platforms starting this Thursday evening in the United States and Friday morning in Armenian Artsakh with a live interview with Garo Pailan, the Armenian Minister of, Arme Minister of Parliament in Turkey, outspoken representative of the HDP party and minority civil rights activist. And with that, and finally, I want to pass it along to Garo to introduce our guest for today. Thank you, Karnik Pari, Egazik Sireli, Ari Nagister, Hayastani Mech, Spirki Mech, Yev Miatsyal Nahangner, Yev Ailur. Good day, everyone, in the United States, in Armenia, Artsakh, and globally. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome back uh, someone who is anything but a yes man, uh, anything but a follower, a leader in his own right none other than Edmond Marukyan, the leader of the Bright Armenia uh, Party uh, in, Ar in Armenia, in Republic of Armenia. Uh, uh, he was a member, uh, Edmond Marukyan, our guest, of the fifth, sixth, and seventh convocations of the National Assembly of the Republic of Armenia from 2012 until 2021. Uh, Edmond Marukyan was born in Vanazor, Armenia, he holds two master's degrees in one in jurisprudence from the Public Administration Academy of Armenia and the second one in law, LLM, with concentration in international human rights law from the University of Minnesota School of Law. He is a human rights advocate and the chairman of the Center for Strategic Litigations, human rights NGO since 2010. Since 2001, he has specialized in the protection of human rights and was considerably involved in strengthening of democracy and sustaining civil society in Armenia. He worked as legal advisor defending citizens in courts, conducted strategic litigations, taking casing up, cases up to the European Court of Human Rights. From 2010, 2010 to 2012, Mr. Marukian worked as a consultant at Human Rights Watch conducting research on human rights issues and drafting statements, letters, and reports. On December 12, 2015, he has established since that date, the Bright Armenia Political Party with like-minded professional young people who have had successful career development achievements in their respective fields and had an interest in entering politics and contributing to the democratic development of Armenia. In October of 2016, Bright Armenia participated in local self-government elections of Vanadzor, the third largest city 
in Armenia with 80,000 population and came the second, came in as a second place after the ruling party, taking 10 seats out of the 33 in the local council. On December 12, 2016, in cooperation with civil contract and Republic political parties, Bright Armenia has formed a political coalition named Way Out, electing Edmund Marukian, our guest, to lead the proportional list of the coalition in parliamentary elections of April 12, April 2nd, rather, 2017. The Way Out Coalition <clears throat> came, excuse me, came, to, came the third out of four political powers forming the new parliament, which consisted of 105 seats. Way, the, the Way Out Coalition was presented in the National Assembly uh, by way of nine MPs, members of parliament. After the Velvet Revolution of 2018, the parliament was dissolved and snap elections were conducted in which 11 political powers took part. However, only three parties made it to the parliament. Bright Armenia Party, led by our guest Edmund Marukian, came in third, taking 18 seats out of 132 in the new parliament. He was leading the Bright Armenia Party, our guest, uh, the Par Bright Armenia Parliamentary Faction in the National Assembly of Armenia until June, just past June of 2021. He has been a member to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Defense, National Security and Internal Affairs, Foreign Relations, State and Legal Affairs, State and Legal Affairs and Protection of Human Rights, Foreign Relations. At the same time, he has been a member to the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe, also commonly known as PACE. He has also been a member to the PACE Committees on Legal Affairs and Human Rights. He's been the first vice chairman. Election of judges to the European Court of Human Rights. Honoring of obligations and commitments by member states of the Council of Europe. Equality and non-discrimination. Sixth convocation of the National Assembly European Union Armenia Parliamentary Cooperation Committee. Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Parliamentary Assembly of NATO, Interparliamentary Committee on Cooperation between the National Assembly of the Republic of Armenia and Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation, Interparliamentary Committee on Cooperation between the National Assembly of the Republic of Armenia and National Assembly of the Arsakh Republic. I'm proud to call him a friend, a friend of front lines, uh, a nationalist and a patriot in my opinion, in my humble opinion, Edmond John Pariegasis. Thank you, Garojan. Thank you so much for your introduction. Thank you for this opportunity. I am at your disposal. Edmond John, I want to start with the resignation of the Armenian president. I want to know what your views are and what it means for Armenia, both constitutionally and politically, especially at this moment in time and in the midst of all these geopolitical issues, the tension and the strife. What, what do you see as the impact of the resignation and the process that is leading to, uh, a, to name a successor? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think, you know, uh, there are many, many rumors and uh, analysis about the resignation of the president. But it was not a surprise uh, for people like me because we knew that the president will not... Uh, be in the office till his term. And he argued always that he's going to resign uh, when we um, draft the text of the constitution or we pass the constitution uh, through referendum and change the system of the uh, governing system in Armenia because he was lobbying the semi-presidential system in Armenia. Uh, and we knew that he, he will resign, but uh, we didn't know that he will resign now uh, and, and the thing is, uh, there are rumors, you know, I, I can't comment on that because I have no information that head, head investigative um, outlet uh, has information that he has a citizenship of other country that it was not allowed uh, to have uh, for being the president of Armenia or being a candidate for president of Armenia, you know, uh, there was, you know, uh, information about his British citizenship, uh, long debates about it, yeah. And then, and then it was solved. Uh, but about this citizenship, we didn't know anything. 
Uh, it's a small state uh, where you invest money and you get citizenship automatically, as I understand. And uh, we will have information about it because there, there is an investigation, as I understand. Um, there was information about it in the media. But uh, according to his statement, uh, he resigns because uh, he can't do anything uh, having no, uh, actually having no any, any uh, influence in, in, in the level of constitution, in the level of legislation, in the level of checks and balances. So uh, it was his argument that in, in these kind of very difficult times for Armenia, the president of the state, the head of the state, has no uh, influence, and that's why he don't want to be uh, president of Armenia, uh, and he resigned. But um, there are rumors, there, there are different information circulating. Uh, I respect uh, the decision of the president. Uh, after the resignation, we have no information about uh, when he will come back. I hope when he will come back, uh, I will try to meet with him. We had good relations uh, when we were in the parliament. We cooperated with the president. We cooperated uh, very closely during a crisis when the um, uh, military leadership uh, demanded the resignation of the prime minister. Uh, and and then during that time, uh, the president has a big role um, with us to manage this crisis. So I highly appreciate and um, uh, I'm thankful for his service. The rest, we will see. As for the regional um, influence of his resignation, you know, um, I don't see any regional or any, you know, uh, geopolitical thing in that. It's totally internal thing, totally internal stuff. And now we got a, a new candidate for the president, uh, you know, the civil contract ruling party I introduced the uh, candidate. Uh, and we'll see. I mean, uh, I, I hope the parliament will, will elect the president during this month. Uh, so, uh, Edmund, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah. Maybe the, the nominee uh, of the ruling party for uh, uh, for the post of president may yeah. not be elected in the first round because it, there's a different requirement in the first round and they don't have enough votes. But clearly, uh, just like they did with the human rights defender uh, uh, coming in to replace our dear friend Arman Tatoyan when his term expires, um, yeah. they will on the second round uh, be able to elect their choice nominee for president as they did for the human rights defender. My question to you is, uh, well, let's talk at first about the rumors that circulated about uh, you being considered for the post of president. And I know that uh, when you visited um, Yerapalur, the National Cemetery, you were asked that question. And I believe your response was, look, I haven't been approached and I'm not going to comment on a matter speculatively because uh, the president uh, uh, who has tendered his resignation is still president until the end of January from what I understood. Uh, yes. were, you, were you offered the position of the presidency? Did you uh, consider it? And do you agree or disagree, and this is a multi-pronged question, that the post of the president rather yeah. is a very, um, a very um, powerless position, if you will. Because my understanding is it ought to be checks and balances. And quite frankly, it's not one that the presidency holds a veto. Uh, it's one that could be very easily overridden uh, by parliament yet again. So really it's a ceremonial position. And I, for one, I'm glad you did not, uh, you did not uh, come up for president of the Republic of Armenia. Yeah. Because it is, it is really, it is not a position that allows people to really do anything. Am I missing something? Well, you're right. I mean, uh, as I said, uh, 
you know, constitutional rights of the president, you know, were, you know, totally diminished during the constitutional changes and after uh, the changes that uh, we had in 2015. And the uh, Yelp Alliance were criticizing the Republican Party that they are taking uh, with every law, uh, uh, every right of the president to do something. Right. Uh, president doesn't have uh, the right. Right to veto. The president has the, passed by the parliament to the constitutional court, to the constitutional court, just it. And, uh, and uh, as, for, as for my case, you know, uh, I was not a Prussian. I didn't get any proposal about that. Of course, my name was circulated in Armenian media uh, with different names, uh, of course. Uh, and uh, I have no information whether inside of the party or the party board in civil contract they have discussion about my candidacy. I was not approached. That's why I said it's not serious to discuss something which you are not offered. Right. Uh, and that, that was it. I mean, you know, before uh, I was a candidate for general prosecutor, then I was a candidate for the ombudsman. Right. Now I was a candidate for uh, the presidency. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm thankful to the people who uh, see me in different high, you know, positions. But there were no debate about it. There were no uh, any proposal, and you know, we, we just go ahead. I mean, um, and now and now and now we have a real candidate. So the rumors and the, all this political information now, it's over. So if I may follow up, I mean, you know, I, I just thought of this uh, as I'm as I'm hearing you speak. You were a big part of the change of the landscape in Armenia in 2018. You were, uh, but very quickly, uh, there was a difference, a fundamental difference of approach, policy, and ideology in some respects, which rendered you an opposition in parliament. And you sacrificed yourself and your political party uh, in favor of snap elections, if you will. Uh, yes. What do you make of the statement made by the prime minister who uh, said, look, the president needs to be on the same page with the government, which to me was shocking because if the president is to, to be on the, on the same page with the ruling party uh, in parliament, then what's the point of checks and balances? We might as well just have the prime minister be president as well. Uh, you were a very vocal opposition, very vocal. And again, I repeat, you for the interest of what you thought at the time uh, was, uh, uh, was a national healing and a unity and, and moving past the calamity of the 44 day war. You were a favored uh, uh, advocate for snap elections. Any regrets? Yes. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. I have no regret. Uh, I'll come from the end of the question. Uh, you know, uh, we were in a situation that was a deep political crisis. Uh, the legitimacy of the government and the parliament was diminished after the 44 days uh, war, after our defeat after November 9 uh, statement uh, signature. Mm -hmm. And we were in a deep crisis. Uh, there are different options. The first one was the resignation of the prime minister and election of the prime minister who will create a government of national unity. We couldn't reach uh, with this kind of decision. In January, prime minister uh, came to the parliament, met with me and Mr. Gagi Tsarukyan, and he offered a uh, snap parliamentary elections. We rejected. We said the country is in a deep crisis, in a political crisis, violence in the streets, and we don't see opportunity for free, fair, transparent, peaceful elections. So then uh, we continued negotiations at the end of the February, then March, and then we agreed with the Prime Minister uh, for the snap elections. Because what happened, you know, I demanded with several other people 
the resignation of the prime minister. Mm -hmm. So he didn't discuss his resignation with any other political party rather than us and Prosperous Armenia after us. So that was we that convinced the prime minister to you know, step down, to resign. We convinced him, we reached that decision, he resigned. Then we all together, we went for the snap elections. The parties were, were uh, they were closing this street, this uh, Bagram street, and the other parties, all parties, I mean, new parties, different alliances, 27 parties uh, participated. Then at the end of the elections, what happened? The people of Armenia re-elected the Prime Minister Pashinyan, then elected as opposition the parties to alliances, which were closing these streets and uh, having all these uh, demonstrations and, you know, uh, hate speech and a lot of things, violence, well, et cetera. We were not, we were not, you know, uh, past. We, we, are, we are not in the parliament. Uh, and, and that was fair. That was fair because, because what happened, uh, we were very polarized in Armenia. And uh, part of the people want to hang Pashinya, let's say. Mm -hmm. And they voted for these two parties. I was not the guy who was lobbying for hanging anyone. I'm a guy who is lobbying for investigative commission for the 44 days war, but not hanging anyone. Pashinyan took a hammer and he said, uh, give, me, give me a new mandate with a new power to punish these guys. And the part of the population was in this line, mm -hmm. okay? They're in line with Pashinya. And who wanna hammer, they voted for the Pashinya. Who wanna uh, put Pashinya to the prison or hang him, they voted for these two parties, for Pai, for Kocharyan and Sersaksyan. And, and this polarized society, you know, voted like that. We and many, many other good parties, they're out of the parliament. That happened, but the elections was free, fair, transparent. Armenian people got a chance to decide their destiny for five you know, uh, future years, and they did it. And every party in Armenia recognized the results of elections. Whatever they say, whatever they say, everybody recognized, because everybody understands that that was the will of the Armenian people, Armenian citizens here in Armenia. And, and we got what we got. But uh, in this story, you know, uh, we paid high price. Mm -hmm. High price was our uh, term in the parliament. We, we, we had uh, three more years. Uh, we paid for that, you know. We paid with our mandates, with our faction. We, are, we have no, uh, any faction, any mandate in the parliament. But what we got, we got peace in Armenian streets. We got end of the political crisis. We got legitimate government which can negotiate uh, on behalf of Republic of Armenia. Because after the war, after the signature of November 9 uh, statement, le the legitimacy of the government, the prime minister, the parliament, totally diminished. And there, was big, there were very big difficulties in negotiating anything. Uh, you know, uh, and but, but I mean, but I mean, you know, what kind of big challenges we have. So that's why, you know, uh, I'm satisfied that what we did, that was for the sake of Armenia. Maybe that was not for the sake of my party. That was not for the sake of my mandate, the parliament, or mandates of my, my people in the parliament. But that was the sake of, of Armenia. That was for the sake of Artsakh. Uh, because we need this peace in our streets in order to figure out what we are going to do with our many, many issues uh, on, on our plate. You know, this is Armenia Turkish relations, uh, demarcation, delimitation, Nagorno Karabakh status, um, original peace and security, uh, restoring our army, restoring our economy after this COVID pandemic and, and this devastating war. So that's why, you know, I have no regret. And uh, I think uh, the people's will uh, is there in the parliament.
Uh, of course, the, the, of course, there is a crisis in the parliament. The crisis from the streets reached the parliament, but but th there are no innocent people in the parliament to be heard. But there are many many innocent people in the streets. So that's why that's why uh, it's somehow you know joke as well. But but I mean they are all there together. You know they, they must figure out that. My campaign was about was about unity was about tolerance, was about national uh, unity government. But we failed. I mean, people don't want that. People want to people wanna hammer, people want to, you know, hanging somebody, you know, that, that was it. I mean. Twice and one you've said, I'm going to turn it over to Karnik. I, I don't have a question. I'm just going yeah, to, yeah. I'm going to, okay. um, and here's my cue to Karnik. Twice in your, uh, response, you refer to the phrase national unity. You sacrifice yes. for national unity, and I, and I uh, applaud you for that because you did. But we have what we have as a result of your sacrifice, and I dare say maybe there isn't uh, street protests today, but there is a mm -hmm. revolution in parliament as a result of your exit. Uh, and do we have a national unity, given the Armenia-Turkey uh, discourse that is underway, Artsakh Armenia relations, and with that, Karnik. Well, I think that's a that's I think that's a great place great place to start. I think that you know, uh, Edmund, your 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 point is well taken in terms of you know uh, removing the turmoil from the streets and putting it into political discourse inside Parliament, um, but. I dare say that the crisis is not over. Maybe the crisis on the streets is over, but I think anybody observing Armenia today in the present geopolitical context would say that the, Armenia is in a very dire crisis right now. And I wanted to, you know, given your, your experience in, in many European and international structures, um, I wanted to ask you about, you know, what, what, what is the way out of the crisis? Is there a way out of the crisis that you feel that the government is trekking towards? Um, what is the, what, you know, and, and, and in that question, you know, quite frankly, I have a number of little sub questions and I'm gonna ask one of them now. What is the policy uh, of the current uh, government vis-a-vis -vis Europe, which you have a lot of experience with, uh, and Russia. There was always a game played uh, by Armenian governments. Today, we're in a very peculiar situation where um, you know, Armenia has been a uh, uh, has a security issue that relies heavily on Russia, um, but yet is courting a lot of European uh, money, European influence. What is, what is, what is your understanding of the of the the, po the political or geopolitical game going on internationally with the president go present government right now, and how do you see that panning out over the next year or so? So, as I understand, I mean, based on my uh, relations and my interaction with different uh, um, diplomats, uh, with different, you know, with, with colleagues from different countries, you know, uh, diplomats and uh, representatives of parties. Uh, their view um, regarding Armenia is this. So Armenia is a democracy. Uh, and uh, we, after that big, you know, uh, crisis and devastating war, you know, we hold elections, parliamentary elections, and we get out from that elections in a very democratic way. So uh, even, even that opposition, uh, which was not, in in a, in a you know in, during the first days after the election uh, was not recognizing like the results of the elections they they went to the constitutional court I mean they used constitutional channel uh, and then they accepted the decision of the constitutional court and now they are in the parliament and they work together whatever we say whatever happens there they work together mm -hmm. so uh, when you look at the Armenian parliament from outside I mean you can understand that the opposition. Uh, accepted the results, accepted the will of the people. If you look at the Georgian case in Georgia, what is happening there? I mean, opposition didn't take mandates after elections, which again were held for the for the for the resolving of the crisis in Georgia. 
so if you are a, a monitoring committee member from the PASA, you will look at it and you will realize, you will compare the Georgian parliament with the Armenian parliament, you realize that, okay, in Georgia there is crisis still because, because uh, the opposition didn't take mandates and they didn't recognize the results of the elections. In Armenia, the crisis solved, you know? And, and they, they view us as a small democracy, which has many, many challenges, but with the government, which is announcing uh, their ambition for, for regional peace, for not peace in Armenia, peace with our neighbors, a regional peace, mm -hmm. that we say that uh, we, we, since we have many, many problems with our two neighbors, let's say, uh, and uh, we want to solve these problems, and we pursue for this peace and our government, our leadership got, you know, support from international, uh, international society. Everybody is willing to help. I mean, international institutions, United Nations, European Union, OST, World Bank, IMF, Western countries, everybody is happy to help Armenia uh, to solve our challenges, our problems with our neighbors in order to have uh, long lasting peace in, in South Caucasus, which is, you know, which is when I pronounce this with, I mean, I have difficulty in that because it's a dream. Uh, yeah, I mean, the long lasting peace in South Caucasus, but, but there's a statement about it made by the prime minister. So, if you look at Armenian leadership from outside, you will get this. So that's why United States is willing to help European Union, France, I mean, with Armenia Turkey relations, uh, OSCE, you know, other international actors, uh, Russian Federation also, you know, the first meeting was in Moscow. Um, regarding Azerbaijani, you know, uh, <clears throat> rhetoric, which is not which is not peaceful rhetoric. Uh, we work to get condemnation. Also, you know, we get we get we get different kind of statements. There are statements that they say you are equal. You know, they say both sides must not use uh, this kind of rhetoric. We say that we didn't use. They just used it. Both mm -hmm. sides, you know, must be you know calm and borderline. Let's say. I mean. And I also, I, I always criticize them because of this. But, you know, there is a big understanding that they must find the way out from this situation, these uh, countries, these both neighbors, and finally uh, open all uh, communications between each other and, 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 and to start to, start, you know, uh, in a level, in a, in, find a level to work together. I don't know what kind of level we can have uh, with Azerbaijan, but for the Turkey, uh, it's much more um, real right now uh, than with Azerbaijan. So uh, your your question was very long. I mean, and and I, I I have a very long answer. If I if I missed anything, just to remind me. No, no, no. I, I think that, you know, I, I wanted to dig on the question of national unity on these points, actually, when it comes okay. to... Okay, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. For that, for that, yeah, for that, we don't have national unity. And we will not have, I mean, in terms of armenia turkish relations, in terms of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, final status, in terms of uh, relations demar about, uh, I mean, this demarcation issue, delimitation issue with Azerbaijan, uh, there is no national unity in that kind of issues, and I don't think that we will have, because you know uh, every party, every uh, historian, every scientist, every citizen, let's say, can have their own view about it. But uh, the ruling party gets the main responsibility to take the responsibility and uh, to solve these problems. Of course, there are issues that we are against, there are issues that other parties are against. There is no national unity in that kind of issues. But those are the problems that will not allow Armenia to go forward. Armenia and Artsakh, when I say Armenia, 
uh, both to go forward. And that's and why we must find you, ways to solve them. I mean. Yeah, you said that we're For not instance, I, I, I can bring one example. I yeah. can bring one example. For instance, uh, regarding Armenia-Turkish uh, relations, right now what is happening, I support. So there is a unity in my, in my, from my side. I support uh, these uh, talks or negotiations, whatever we say, uh, we got invoice from Armenia and from Turkish side for, uh, for um, you know, negotiating and having ties with Turkey, opening borders and having diplomatic ties. I support uh, these negotiations without any precondition, which is very important, without any precondition. And I support it without any precondition. I mean, the Turkish negotiations in 2008. At that time, I was not a member of the parliament. I was not in politics. I was a human rights defender, but I support it as a citizen. Right now, I support it. But there are many, many issues, internal, you know, uh, foreign relations, uh, that we have different views and with different visions about it. Uh no, no, yeah. I, I want to let you go. You know, if no, you no, 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 no. I, I was going to comment that I that I saw the eyebrows go up. So it's your you're 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 biting at the chomping at the bit. Edmund, I'm going to give you a little, bit, a little bit of a tough love. Now, obviously, when we talk about Armenia Turkey relations, uh, I hope and I and I and I'm confident that you at least personally do not ignore the. Uh, in the equation, the seven or eight million Armenians in the diaspora. You see, yes. you see us in the diaspora, with the exception of those who joined us in the diaspora after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, uh, the Armenians of Armenia who came and joined us in different parts of the world. Sure. Those of us in the diaspora are descendants of the Armenian genocide. Uh, sure. We have been raised with horrific first-hand accounts of our, uh, of our grandparents, some of their parents, but certainly I, my grandparents and my great-grandparents, first-hand accounts. So I applaud you when you say, and you said this, as to Artsakh, Artsakh gayatsats kordzone yev amvodan kain iravijaga bahban gume rus chagabahmeri bichotsov. Aveli vadan kavore, hai turkagan panatsutuner chunenale, chigar kavorele, and I get that. Dima eliem achaktsum gar kavor mana, borovedev chigar kavoruma, perelume, perelue nora havilke. And you just said no preconditions. You support it with no preconditions. But come on, Edmond, you are a bright, one of the brightest people I've encountered, and I've encountered quite a few people. Do you really think that in any neg negotiation, we start from a point zero, but we are sooner or later going to have conditions. We're going to say, I want this. The other one is going to say, I want that. Uh, and do you not think that the government of Republic of Armenia owes a duty to the Armenian nation, the global Armenian nation, to add a minimum, whether it's through its um, Spirki Hans Tagatar, Baron Zare Sinanian, of, uh, formerly of Glendale, California, or through the prime minister, or through the foreign ministry, engage and consult the diasporan concerns. Now, you know, in 2008, when you talk about, you know, you were not in parliament and, and you were involved in human rights and the president then, uh, was it 2008? I think it was Serge Sarkisian, yes. Uh, uh, you know, he tried, and, and I remember the protocols I met with the president of Republic of Armenia at the time here in Los Angeles as part of a large diasporan delegation. Uh, this is a very sensitive issue. This is a very sensitive issue. At the end of the day, I understand that, you know, we are surrounded by Azerbaijan, we are surrounded by Turkey, two very hostile nations, in my opinion. We're surrounded by Iran and Georgia. I'll call them lukewarm, if you ask me. I am not a political scientist by any means. 
But what is your vision? I appreciate that you support the government in its endeavors, but don't you think that there ought to be, uh, you know, as the unit political party leader, you consult your constituents. Well, who are the constituents of the Republic of Armenia? The 3 million uh, residents of Armenia or the 11 million Armenians of the, of the globe? What are your thoughts about this? Thank you for the question. It's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, uh, I myself, ready to consult with the diaspora people. And right now we are consulting. We are exchanging our views about I mean, Turkish relations. I'm ready to do that, you know, in any uh, uh, platform. I mean, visiting different cities and uh, uh, states, uh, you know, overseas, you know, and, and, and meeting with the diaspora people. And I do so. Uh, I have many, many meetings outside. Uh, and I think the Armenian government, the prime minister, uh, Mr. Rubinian, you know, as you said, uh, Zare Sinanyan, uh, Foreign Minister Arat Mirzoyan, and they are also uh, uh, must, I think, uh, to consult with the diaspora people uh, regarding this sensitive issue. And I agree that it is, it is a sensitive issue. It is a sensitive issue for all of us. Uh, my ancestors are from Hearts. It's a sensitive issue for me as well. But I said that not regulating our relations with Turkey uh, will bring more problems than regulating the mm -hmm. relations. And I said that if we succeeded in 2008, during Serge Saksian's time when he was you know, negotiating, uh, then we will not have this kind of war. And even if we will have a war, the Turkey will not have this kind of role engaged in that, in, in, in that, in that war. So, uh, and as for the preconditions, so in an official level, first time, there is a statement of the foreign affairs ministry, both sides, ministries of both sides, Turkey and Armenia, that you know, stated that we are you know, negotiating without preconditions. It's a statement. And the, that word is used in that statement. I was very happy after that after the meeting when, I, when it was released. Uh, so, of course, we can talk about that. Yeah, they said, but there must be, and there, there are some, you know, of course we can say. Of course, uh, uh, from Turkish side, they will uh, uh, say that, okay, Armenia has also preconditions. They say uh, without preconditions, but Armenian side, uh, uh, Republic of Armenia, and if not Republic of Armenia, Armenian diaspora, of course, they have preconditions and stuff like that. But uh, my vision is this. If we can uh, come up with a decision to uh, have ties with Turkey, to open borders, and to have diplomatic ties in a first level, embassies, and to start talking between each other, uh, that will be a big step forward, a big step forward. As for the Armenian genocide issue, Nobody puts aside, nobody forgets the genocide. There are, you know, uh, articles, you know, critics, and uh, there are rumors, blah, 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 you know, whatever, whatsoever, but, but, but it's not true. I mean, nobody, nobody uh, put aside, nobody, uh, you know, betrayed, let's say, let's say uh, the genocide issue. And the Armenian genocide, this is first time, this is first time that we are in a negotiation with Turkey in a situation that three permanent members of the UN Security Council recognized Armenian genocide. This is the first time that the United States, France, and Russia already recognized, and we are in a negotiation with Turkey before it didn't happen. So that's why, I mean, uh, let's talk, let's continue. Of course, let's work with diaspora. Uh, and I am willing and I will lobby in a government uh, using my ties in Armenian government to start and to find, a, find platforms to talk to diaspora. But we must, you know, go forward. 
we must go forward, we must regulate our relations. Otherwise, I will restate, we will get much more problems than, than we have before. And on the other hand, you know, uh, I think for Armenian people uh, here in Armenia and in diaspora, uh, we, we must have new agenda. We must have new agenda. And the new agenda is not about the issues that we have and we had, you know, before. It's, the new agenda is about our economy. The new agenda is about our GDP. The new agenda is, uh, is about our military budget. Let's think together what to do to, to double our GDP. Let's think together what to do to double our budget. Let's think together what to do to double our military budget. You know, when, when, our, when our GDP uh, is considerably lower than Azerbaijani GDP, when you go back for 10 years and you look at our military budget, spend our military expenditure, and military expenditure of Azerbaijan. What will you think about it? So those are the questions that we must think about. It. So those are the questions that I think must become the priority for Armenian government, for Armenian I, diaspora. I wanted, because, I if, because if we are if we are not solving these issues, if okay. we are not solving these issues, then then what we can do? I mean, what kind of historical or current issue we can solve? What we are talking about, let's put all emotions aside and look at digits, look at, at, at what is happening here. We are now not a state of 3 million people. We are a state of two and, 2 million and about 900,000 million. You and know, not, and, and our, our neighbors, you know, they are developing, they are growing, they, are, they have a GDP, 48 billion GDP, you know, uh, Azerbaijan. I mean, we spent in, in 2020, we spent 634 million in, in military expenditure. They spent 2.2 billion. What uh, we want to do, I mean, what we want to do, what we, what we are thinking about in this issue. Edmond, Edmond, you know, with Karnik's permission, is this may be the very last question I ask you in this program, because I, because I know yeah. Karnik, I, I've hogged quite a bit of time here, but you know, yeah. let's talk about new issues. You know, yeah, I understand, you know, the genocide is a, 107 year old issue come April this year. Uh, but what about Artsakh? I mean, the Republic of Turkey uh, mm -hmm. destroyed and, and was a catalyst in destroying mm -hmm. human lives, uh, peaceful civilians, and, and countless, countless uh, residential communities and caused a displacement. Edmond, and you'll agree with this. Mm -hmm. A displacement, mm -hmm. not unlike what occurred in the genocide. You know, sure. we had we had so many people, you know, uh, homeless as a result of their <coughs> their tacit support. Now we're going to engage in discourse because we want to have peace. And and I appreciate that you said a couple of days ago that to avoid new wars, uh, we need to uh, figure out our relationships politically and uh, mm -hmm. geopolitically. And also, we need to engage in what you call reforms within the Armenian army uh, uh, so that we make it stronger. But you know what? There, everyone, you know, you've been to Artsakh, I've been to Artsakh many, many times. There's people living there. And, yeah. and now we are sitting across the table with the very same people that just turned their lives upside, upside down, not to mention the, the mayhem and murder that they caused. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I asked you before, when we, you know, in a couple of days, a few days back, when we were chatting, you and I, uh, you know, from long distance. Let's talk about Armenia Artsakh relations. Where does Armenia Artsakh relations fit into this Armenia Turkey discourse? Do you see where it fits in there? I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot and say, well, if you were Rubinian and representing Armenia in dialogue, would you consider saying, what about Artsakh? I mean, is, is Turkey now going to say, recognize territorial integrity of Azerbaijan sooner or later, which is going to just swallow up Artsakh? What's gonna happen? I'm not the politician. I have a lot of respect for you. So get me out of this. Uh, this Garo, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Whatever you said, whatever you said, 
I totally agree and I sign, I endorse whatever you say. But we must do this for the sake of the people who live here in Armenia and Artsakh. We must do this for the sake of our children. Mm -hmm. Because if we talk about destruction, killing the people, genocide, and if, if, if we go you know, further, then of course we can also realize that our enemies are capable to destroy whole Armenia at all. Mm -hmm. They are capable to do that. I mean, look at their armies, look at their, uh, look at their capabilities. So what we want to do, we want to save and develop this Armenia with Artsakh, or we want to go down and down and down and lose everything, whatever we have now. We had 42,000 kilometers together with Artsakh. Because of our immature policies, we lost it. And if we continue not understanding the realities, not understanding our capabilities, not realizing where we live, in what kind of hostile region we live, not realizing our challenges, may we lose the rest that we have. It's a question which is a very difficult one. If you look at our history, mm -hmm. we had this kind of issues. We, 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 we end up with these kind of situations. We disagree and we lose the situation that we could agree and have at that time. We disagree, we lose the situation that we, we could have something at that time. And we got this very small Armenia because of that. And then there is a big, big uh, challenge that if the people of Armenia will realize that there is no future peace in this country, will they live in this country? As I said, this is not a three million, this is not a three million country. As for the Artsakh issue, of course, I mean, of course, this issue may, may arise. But as I said, for this, you know, uh, right now for this issue, for, for Armenia Turkey negotiations, we have statements right now that both sides, they, you know, stated that we uh, started and we are talking, we are negotiating without preconditions. There are many, many actors in the region, Carl, believe me, many, many actors that they don't want to have, uh, you know, successful, that they don't want to see successful uh, negotiations between us. I agree. We, we will get many, many obstacles. Azerbaijan will create many, many obstacles. But I believe that Turkey has its own national interests. Azerbaijan has its own national interests. And of course, Turkey is defending Azerbaijan, but in their own national interests stands this issue that they must uh, solve the issue with, uh, you know, diplomatic ties and opening borders. This is in, in, in Turkish uh, national uh, interests as well. Uh, we, will, we will have many, many obstacles during the negotiations. And uh, it's not easy. The borders will not be open tomorrow. The embassies will not be open tomorrow. Th this is a big uh, issue and, uh, you know, very hard and sensitive, as you said. But we must go forward. Uh, and as, as for Artsakh, you know, uh, the status of Nagorno-Karabakh is not yet resolved. Uh, our position is this, that OSC means group must continue working on the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Azerbaijan does everything to not allow OSCE Minsk Group to work, to come to the region, to visit Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, they do everything you know, to not allow. You know this. Uh, Armenian state totally supports the people who live in Nagorno-Karabakh with budget, with whatever we can. I will not go uh, forward then, you know and tell what. So we do our best, but we are in a very difficult situation. I mean, we must get out from this situation. We must start to think about our GDP. We must start to think about our budget. If not, then this Armenia is in danger. And this is the only statute, the only statute that 
as you said, 11 million, 11 million Armenians, you said, 11 million Armenians have this only status. And, 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 and we all must care about this. This is the only state that we have. I may recognize it later. Thank you. Karnik, yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I'm just- No, 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 that's okay. I wanted to just jump in here on a couple of, a couple of things. I think that there's a problem in terms of the, you know, if you wanna, if there's talk of a precondition, I think that the precondition that I'm most concerned about is our own understanding of what the pillars of our national identity are. I think this is yes, where yeah. we struggle. This is where we struggle. And I have to say, you know, the talk of the GDP, you mentioned we have to focus on right after the war. All right, I keep having flashbacks to the report. I can't remember the, uh, the organization that did the, the study, the poll. But the issue of Artsakh was on the bottom of the list. And yeah. the issue of economics was on the top of the list. Now, I understand what the voters are thinking about from an economic standpoint, I get it. Everybody wants to put food on the table and have a prosperous life. I, get, I understand that. Um, but there's something that we're missing. And that is, I think, no Armenian left behind, no Armenian forgotten. This is where I think that we struggle as a nation because until it comes to Sunik, until it comes to Yerevan, there's always going to be this, you know, uh, well, you know what, I don't feel it on my skin. So therefore it's not an issue. The issue of, uh, in the Artsakh war, the issue of ethnic cleansing was front and center. Now hearing some of the discourse uh, is almost like having whiplash. Like we, I felt as if we were all on the same page, understanding that our survival as an Armenian, as an Armenian nation had certain kind of core elements, right? Um, it had the, uh, the independence and self-determination of the Artsakh Armenians as one of its core. And I have to say, I think most people were at least view observers were shocked to find that the voters don't think that. The voters didn't think that, right? I mean, that was what the poll showed, that there were a lot of other issues that were much more important for the Armenian voter than these issues, which I think have some sort of national cohesion. If we believe that uh, uh, that the, the future of the Armenians of Artsakh is less important than, let's say, economic GDP. I understand the idea of strengthening a state. I understand that. I'm not saying, but these things are not necessarily mutually exclusive because what it is is an understanding. It's a psychological approach to who you are as a nation. If we believe that the non, that everything is negotiable for GDP or negotiable for you know, uh, building you know high tech industries, or the, at some point we've diluted our understanding of national identity to the point where we are no longer. When I say we, the state is no longer in service of the name of the nation. This is why. Garnik, I'm sorry. I think I think I misunderstood. I think I misunderstood. No, uh, the, the issue of Artsakh was never uh, in the you know in the last in the last uh, place. The issue of security was never in the last place. Not for you. In a rhetor oh, in no, a, no, in not a rhetor for you. No, 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 no. For, for the people as well. I, I disagree. For the people as well. You know, uh, I mean, I totally disagree. Armenian citizens here, they give soldiers for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we cannot say that the issue of Artsakh was not in the first place or security. But what I'm arguing is this. If we are not concentrating on the strengthening of our statehood, then how we can secure the people of, Azer, uh, of, of, of Artsakh uh, from Azerbaijan? How we can give them security? How we can defend them from Azerbaijan? If we have this military budget, I said 634 million we spent in 2020, they spent 2.2 billion. Mm -hmm. So I mean, emotions, these national things are very good, are fine. But we lost the war, war. Uh, we lost the war uh, to technologies. We lost the war to population because there are 10 million, we are about 3 million. They have billions, we don't have that billions. We lost the war for that. I mean, we didn't lose the war that we are, we are not patriotic. We didn't lose the war that we are not united against our enemies. No, no, I mean, let's, let, let me be clear. We lost the war because we didn't develop our country. 
we lost the war that we had because we had wrong narratives during 30 years. We lost the war because we lost the diplomacy because of our wrong narratives. I mean, I can go on and on. I mean, but, 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 but my argument was, was this, if we are not becoming smarter, if we are not going to have more children, if we are not going to have uh, more you know, GDP uh, quality and results, then how and then what we are going to talk about? I mean, what will say uh, people living in Artsakh? What will say our diplomats who have one one ambassador and and one diplomat? Our embassies is one plus, one plus, one two plus. How are you going to do that diplomacy? This poor with these poor embassies, with these poor channels, with these poor platforms. How you are gonna you know defend your national interests? I mean, whatever you say, I mean, you need resources. I'm talking about resources. It's human resources, you know, economic, eco economical resources, new technologies. Look, look at our, our budget, how much money we spent on science. Look, go, go 10 years back. Go 10 years back, how much money we spent on science. Turkey created Bayraktar. What created Armenia? I mean, it's uh, because you know we all are patriots. I believe uh, that we all are patriots. We all, you know, love our motherland, uh, our state, our nation, our identity. Those are all. Those are you know very very important things. Important things. But but I want to just. Uh, take all the people of our all armenian people to down to down stand stand on the, on the on our land and 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 think about this land like from emotions you know from this high high things high uh, you know visionary stuff just just to see what we have to, to just diagnose what happened with us just diagnose our situation and then let's let's find ways uh, because as i understand you know i misunderstood i mean this is not about that uh, um, having food is, is important than our nation. No, no, it's not about it. Or having, you know, jobs is it's important. Uh, no, but what we must do to keep our people in our villages. Do you know that we have villages that we have uh, in a grade one, just one, one guy, one children going to the school? I mean, what we must do, what we must do to keep our people in our villages, in our cities, in our country, is a big migration. And that was before, that was is now, uh, that was uh, since independence of Armenia, we are losing people. We are losing people all the time. Uh, and, and how we are going to keep this state. Uh, you know, <clears throat> that's why I said that we need new narratives. And this new narratives is about our science, economy, uh, demography, how to solve these issues, our military, you know, uh, then we can think about other things. If not, then nothing will happen. Let, let, let's be, you know, very, very realistic. If we are not restoring our economy, if we are not restoring our army, our diplomacy, I love it all the time for, for proactive diplomacy. Proactive diplomacy. We never have. It. We wait for any resolution against us and then we react. We react. We react. <laughs> and, and nothing happens. I mean, we, we can't do anything against it. So because because we are so we were we were you know you know uh, so poor and so weak. How we can do that? Uh, or, 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 you know, believing that somebody will come and help us, uh, waiting for somebody, uh, this uh, uh, country or that country, I don't want to name, uh, you know, during the war, after the war, till now, there are rumors, many, many rumors that we were proposed with this kind of help, we denied, we were proposed with this kind of help, we were denied. It's, it's a lie, total lie. We were not proposed with any kind of help from anyone. It's a total lie. We were not proposed with anything. There is no any condemnation. 
uh, about this uh, 44 days war, about these mass killings. That was a genocide. Is there any condemnation from any Western institution, any Western country? Till now, our, our uh, hostages, uh, prisoners of war in Azeri prisons, tortured and you know, killed. Till now, they are there. Who cares? I mean, I mean, we must be very realistic. I mean, I'm just about it. And that's why my hope and my vision is this. We are uniting, with, you know, defending with the, the, this vision. If not, if not, you know, then I don't see how we can get out from this situation. Or can, can we be united in, in doubling our GDP? I mean, uh, who is against the people? Let, let's be united. I understand that we cannot be united in the issue of uh, armenia turkey relations. Mm -hmm. We cannot be united. I mean, in diaspora and even here, uh, many, many people do uh, think that it's, it's a bad idea. Let's keep our borders closed. Uh, let's, let's not have any diplomatic relations. I mean, we have, we have parties, we have people, but there are issues that we can be united. Uh, GDP, budget, ask, science, development. But I do want to ask the, on, on this. You know, is there is there a uni, un, uh, unity on the Artsakh situation? Is there is there a unified goal for Artsakh within the government, within the people? Are we going no. to see that? No. No, and 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 and, and we, we doesn't have before. You know, there were lobby in Armenia that we must recognize our South Republic. You remember, there was a lobby. There was another lobby that it's not time. We are in negotiations. Then there was an opinion that when the war will start, because one day it will start. <laughs> At that time, we will recognize. Then the war started <laughs> on September 27. I had a speech in the parliament and I proposed to recognize our there is a video in YouTube. That's why I said, you know, there is no unity. I mean, this is a democratic country and every party, every citizen has its own vision what to do, uh, what we must do. There is no uh, really vision about it. Uh, uh, there is just one vision that we want a peace. And uh, the ruling party with this statement got 54% votes during elections six months ago. That's the only thing that I can tell you. But there are different, you know, movements in Armenia, different movements. So uh, that's why uh, I think I think we must we must concentrate on issues that we can unite everyone. Uh, I want to, you know, you mentioned about we're a democratic country in Armenia. It made me uh, remember. Uh, I'm curious, what are your thoughts about this individual, Haik Mamijanian, uh, voting against uh, the, uh, the vote in Europe about um, Armenia being uh, a democratically um, run, uh, functioning of democratic institutions, mm -hmm. uh, and, he, and he his, I guess, I guess his or his supporters' uh, explanation is that he viewed that vote to be a resolution which he labeled it pro Nikol uh, versus pro Armenia. I, I'm I'm astonished. Uh, can you uh, give me any insight about that, Edmund? Yeah, of course. I mean, as a former uh, delegate to the PASA and having high positions in that institution. I, you, know, you know, it's it's not it's not an issue that uh, come up now. Mm -hmm. I criticized them that why you are not attending to the meetings in past time. because a position in the parliament when they came they said we will not go to any uh, visit any state visit or any delegation visit uh, be the ruling party civil contract. And they started to boycott. They boycotted sessions. When you boycott, you cannot propose your proposals. You cannot uh, work with the monitoring 
people from the monitoring committee to tell them that, for instance, we have this issue in our democratic institutions, then you must write about it there. If they work hard, they will get it in the, in the resolution and they could vote for that. But they didn't work, they boycotted it. So, and the monitors, monitoring guys, they wrote what they knew. They wrote what they had on their plate. Mm -hmm. Later on, they said, cease, you didn't see these problems that we have in Armenia, in our democracy. So we are against it. Mm -hmm. But my argument is this, there is a provision about Nagorno-Karabakh, mm -hmm. that Nagorno-Karabakh issue must be uh, resolved uh, under the auspices of the OSC Minsk Group co-chairmanship. That, you know, Azerbaijan was against it. Turkey was against it. They worked very hard to take down it, uh, that, that provision from the resolution. So there is a provision about our prisoners of war that Azerbaijan must uh, return them. So only for that, only for that, I think he must vote for, not for, not, not against. Even he could, you know, he could abstain, but not against. That's my, that's my opinion. I was opposition there. I was opposition. But when I see that, you know, there are issues that prevail, there are issues that prevail on my internal uh, staff or uh, my internal political taste, then, you know, state, state, you know, must be, must be valued. Your, your issues, which, which is important for you. Uh, and they showed with this uh, step that for them, it's much more important to, to let's say, hit the ruling party than to defend, you know, uh, the provisions that I already said. So that's it. I mean, but it's again, you're right, it's democracy. It, it was his right to vote, and he voted against, and it was his decision, his party's decision. And that's okay. And the people who are criticizing him, they have right to criticize, and it's also okay. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for what really has been a very lively discussion, and I and I appreciate very much your frankness and your the scope of uh, issues that you covered today. Um, we do appreciate it very much, and 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 your insights on those points are very much uh, appreciated. Um, I think. Uh, we want to, uh, I think, you know, Gato was going to say a couple of last words, but I wanted to give you an opportunity, Edmund, to say any closing thoughts that you might have uh, to, uh, to our viewers. Uh, I know we covered a lot of subjects, but if there is any subject that you feel that you'd like to make a point of, uh, please, please do so. You know, <clears throat> I, I just remembered uh, my speech in... Uh, Minneapolis in 2009, uh, in 2010, sorry, when I was studying in the University of Minnesota Law School. So I remember uh, when we had a gathering in Armenian church, St. Saad Armenian church in Minneapolis and St. Paul, two cities. And we had gathering on April 24, genocide day. And the uh, whole of the, you know, uh, church was, uh, full of Armenian diaspora people. And I had a speech. I said, my dear friends, compatriots, uh, my message is this, Armenia has many challenges and this is the only state to, that Armenian people have. We, with Artsakh, have 42,000 kilometers. It's a very big deal after 700 years of Having no state. It's a dream for our you know, ancestors. But now we have. Let's concentrate on this Armenia. Let's use all our resources. Let's identify us with this Armenia. And let's develop this Armenia. Otherwise, this is a hostile neighborhood, hostile region. We will have challenges, and we cannot stand alone against these challenges. That was. 12 years ago, I was a fellow in the University of Minnesota Law School. And my 
my my vision i didn't change it it's the same again of course after this devastating war we lost 4000 lives we lost thousands of kilometers uh but still we can stand up still we can stand up and go forward and if we are united and if we take the reality as it is and make necessary steps to develop this statute then we will win that's my vision and i believe in it and i call on all our diaspora friends to you know to be united on this kind of issues that we talk about thank you so much and i and i'm available always to talk with you it was lovely discussion uh, and, and, and i hope we'll have much more you know platforms and opportunities to uh, even meet in person and talk about these issues thank you so much for this opportunity thank you edmund and uh, garo any final words yes i have a few final words First, let me thank Edmond. Edmond is always a gentleman and a scholar in my book. We may not always agree, but we certainly are uh, polite enough with one another to agree to disagree. And we agree more often than we do disagree. Um, I want to thank you. I really want to thank you. Uh, I didn't get around to ask you, uh, so I'm going to take another one minute. If you can give me a short response, and I'll give my closing remarks sure. after What's in the future for Edmond Marukian and, and the Bright Armenia Party? What are you guys up to? Well, the party, you know, is active in different fields. We run uh, the School of Liberal Politics. Mm -hmm. We work with young generation. We try to change our environment where we live uh, to be understandable because we end up in a situation that we were not understood by the people. And we are here, we will serve our country, our statute, and uh, Edmond Marukian as well. I'm much more now uh, engaged in uh, you know, foreign relations using our ALDE platforms, raising our voices you know, in different European conferences and platforms and to defend Armenian national interests. Also, uh, I do strategic litigations in European Court of Human Rights and now we are working on, on war crimes as well uh, um, regarding the Azerbaijani aggression and also with uh, about the rights of the, the rights of the uh, people of Hadrut and Shushi uh, who lost their properties there as well. Uh, Tarnik, so, Tarnik only works 20 hours a day, so you can contact him for the other four hours yeah. a day. Uh, he's an excellent sure. international lawyer, I can attest to it. He can, he can provide you all the assistance you need. There you go. I'm sticking you with more stuff to do, Karnik. Uh, yeah, I, I, go ahead. Just, just one thing, you know, I will, I, I will continue my service to Armenia and to our nation. In you know, what capacity, I think doesn't matter. I, I, and I, you know, and I, and I, that is why I applaud you, Edmond, because uh, from the, from the uh, supporting of the snap elections, which uh, uh, landed you on the outside looking in, and from the outside continuing to do that, which in my opinion, unfortunately, some on the inside are not doing, uh, is, is worthy of recognition. So I thank you for that. Uh, and, and as for my closing remarks, gentlemen, and, um, fellow audience members, if you will. Uh, I, I wanna give a shout out to the young Armenian generation uh, uh, and a couple of uh, young men, uh, Zaven and Van of Zartonk Media, uh, an independent global media company powered by innovative technology that scales quality, answering the always changing needs of modern Armenian audiences. Their dedication, in my opinion, their passion, in my opinion, and drive make Zartonk Media a keystone of modern Armenian media, uh, becoming the diaspora's fast number one Armenia media platform, uh, wide and far in many corners of the world. It continues to be the home for all things Armenian. I saw uh, my dear brother and friend, 
Karnik featured there and an upcoming uh, ICJ related discussion he will have on February 17. Um, and um, in just three years, these young uh, Armenian uh, forward thinking folks have garnered hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of followers. And why am I saying all of this with a smile and a, and a joy in my heart? Because they've decided in their infinite wisdom, and it's pretty wise, I think, uh, to have front lines premiere uh, with a special edition on Thursday and thereafter every Tuesday on Zartong Media's platforms from Facebook to YouTube and uh, Instagram. And we are going to have a special edition on Thursday following up on uh, many of the same topics we discussed with our guest and friend Edmund Marukian at the moment uh, with none other than Member of Parliament of Republic of Turkey, Garo Pailan. Uh, Garo Pailan's, uh, one of the recent quotes is what I want to close with and, and ask that we all think about that. Uh, Garo Pailan said one of Haran Dink's biggest dreams was the opening of the Armenian border, the border gate, if you will. And he said, the day it opens, I will go there. Garo Pailan said, let's hope that together we can make this dream of Haran Dink come true. As Armenians and Turks, uh, or Turkians, uh, in the translation of Google, if you will, we will suffer at that border together. Now, I don't know what he meant. I intend on asking Garo Pailan about what he believes he means by that. He said, I also have a dream. If we open the Armenian-Turkey border gate and name that border gate Haran Dink, an Armenian from Turkey, I hope we will make this happen and, as, and we as the people of Armenia and Turkey make peace. That's a tall order for me. It's a very big old tall order for me. Uh, it's all about perspective, I suppose. And it's all about feelings. And if there are ever two things that are neither right or wrong, they are perspective and they are feelings. Feelings are feelings. They're not right, they're not wrong. And perspectives are often the byproduct of feelings and life, life experiences. So let's hope that while we perhaps hail from different perspectives and different life experiences, and therefore we might espouse different feelings and keeping in mind the call of Edmund Marukyan that you know, we have to keep our feelings in check. And I think we should. But we must never, we must never ignore our feelings. Our feelings do play a role. Let us hope that our feelings do not play a negative role and keep us from realizing that which some among us apparently believe, and I hope they are right, that peace with Turkey is good for Armenia, for Artsakh, and for Armenians. And let us all, as Armenians, as Artsakhsis and as disciples and loyal citizens of Armenia, whether we live there or not, espouse for peace for the Armenian nation. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching. And thank you, Edmund, for being part of us. Uh, as always, we'll be in touch again soon. Thank you, Garan Garnik. Thank you so much. Warmogs.